there and welcome to Wednesday Night Live. Uh, I hope everyone has been having a fantastic week with their horses and without of course. And uh, we are coming to you live this Wednesday. I do apologise for missing last week's Wednesday Night Live. We were in the middle of the 10 day course uh, that was going on uh, just here locally at... Um, Glen Ray we had the 10 day course on and quite often I'm able to post and do the Wednesday night live while the course is going on but I just wasn't able to organize it uh, they're pretty long days they're they're kind of uh, you know we meet for breakfast every day and then um, we you know we have breakfast lunch and dinner together so the days kind of start at 7 30 in the morning and they don't really end until 7 30 8 o'clock at night so um really long days but wow what a fantastic course it was it was um jam-packed full of information we had i think in the end we had about four or five guest um uh, instructors and speakers and practitioners and all that sort of stuff come and help us and uh, talk to us about different areas of us or different areas of our horses. So it was a really comprehensive course along with all the um, the curriculum that I developed uh, for the course, the TKH part of it. So it was an amazing 10 days. Uh, hi to everyone who is watching that was at the course. I hope you're all back home and back to reality. Um, I know I am and I've been running around a bit for the last couple of days. So uh, what we're talking about tonight, and the, uh, you know, it's foaling season, and uh, I thought that would be a really cool opportunity to talk about um, f my guidelines or the or you know the tips that I would give to people when we're talking about handling foals. So that's our Wednesday night live for tonight. A little bit inspired by um, one of our TKH um, peeps. Karen has just had her first foal for the season at Greenfield Start. A gorgeous little fjord um, foal was born. I think he was born last night. Uh, so congratulations to all of them at Greenfields. And, uh, you know, we've been working with them for many years now. So we've got to see quite a number of foal crops come through. And, uh, and so the first one was born uh, last night for the season. So we're really excited to see uh, how he starts to unfold. So... That's kind of, you know, I saw that and I thought, you know, now's a really good opportunity to start talking about um, foals and how we handle them and, um, you know, probably just some guidelines in regards to it because we have, um, you know, we've got a massive spectrum about how people handle foals. So you've got everything from... I'm going to let the mother do everything. I'm going to turn him out in the paddock and I'm going to run them naturally and I'm not going to bring them in. I'm not going to touch them until they're six months old or a year old or whatever. That's one um, theory. And then you run all the way up the scale to um, people who follow Dr. Miller's imprint, foal imprinting system. For those of you that are not familiar with that, there's been uh, he's written several books on foal imprinting. Uh, very interesting read and very interesting man. I get to spend a little bit of time with Dr. Miller when I'm in the United States, generally at Cowboy Dressage uh, World Finals. He's all, he's been there every year, uh, both speaking and um, presenting there. So we get to we get to sit down with him and say hello and have some pretty interesting chats with Dr. Miller. So that's really cool. So you've got that big spectrum. I'm not going to touch them at all. To I'm going to imprint them as soon as they come out of their mother. I'm going to be in there and I'm going to be imprinting them. So I'm not really going to talk about the differences in between those different theories. And obviously there's everything in between. Um, but what I am going to talk about is my five guidelines for handling baby horses and what I've done for, for our horses personally or what we typically do here um, when we have foals. So the first one that I think is really important to talk about, it's probably a mistake that most of us make because foals are oh so cute and they're very, very curious and they sort of want to come up to you and stick their nose on you and all that sort of stuff. So what I'm going to say first is set the boundaries early. Set boundaries early. Um, you know, that means that your foal doesn't get to, uh, you know, push you with his head or he doesn't get to pour at you. He doesn't get to nibble on you. He doesn't get to kick out at you. doesn't get to rub on you. He doesn't get to push on you. So all of the stuff that you would not let an adult horse do, you rubbing, pushing, you know, running at you, all those sorts of things, 
um, you know, turning their bum and, and asking for a scratch. That's probably one of the biggest things that we see with foals is, oh, he only wants a scratch. He's turning his bum at me. Inevitably, most people who have a foal that comes up to them and, and um, you know, ask for a little bum scratch, often they will get very playful in that and they'll sort of start humping up and kicking up and doing those little cute things. And um, then later on down the track when they're big, it's not as cute and funny anymore. And then you really have to start stepping in and setting a boundary, which isn't fair because the boundary wasn't set when when the foal was born, right? So um, I'm not saying that you have to you know, I don't want people going out and hitting their foals all the time because foals are naturally curious and they will be coming up to you and you definitely want to preserve that and you definitely want to encourage that behavior. But even though they're curious and you want to encourage behavior, you also want to set boundaries so they understand, you know, this is what I do with my foley friends in the paddock. I'm not allowed to do that with my, with my human friends in the yard. So... Um, you know, number one, set boundaries early. The same boundaries apply to the foal as they do to the adult horse, but you will approach setting the boundaries perhaps in a different way. An older horse, um, typically we talk about older horses that would know better, which means that the older horse typically would have received the training in regards to no biting, no pushing, no but coming to me bum first, no kicking up at me, all of those sorts of things. So the older horse is doing it from a place of, um, you know, probably trying to push a boundary where the foal's doing it from a place of, I do this to my mom, I do this to my friends in the paddock, I, I, you know, I don't know any better at all. So you have to really educate and take on board that educating a foal um, from these early days is vital, but you do have a different approach to it um, so you don't cause a, a shyness in the foal or discourage them from coming up to you and things like that. The second guideline for handling baby foals is to keep it simple. Um, I absolutely agree with training foals. I do um, spend a lot of time, um, you know, handling foals for people and, and putting sort of initial handling on them. And um, I 100% I, I believe that it's a great investment for a foal's future. And I think it's great for their future development. But what I do think is that we need to keep it very, very simple for a foal. Um, in terms of initially what I like to do, one of the first things I'll do with a foal when I meet a foal, you know, the mum comes up to you, the foal comes up to you, they're typically pretty curious, they come up and they want to smell you or scratch you. Once they've built enough confidence to come up to you and sort of not be worried about you reaching out to touch them, I'm immediately going to start teaching them to move off pressure so I'm going to I might put my hand on their chest and just put a little tiny feel in the chest and just see if they can rock back I'm going to put a little feel in there see if they can maybe take one step back it's it's super 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 tiny super 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 simple so if you get them to do that little one step you know every day for you know, a hundred days, you're going to be able to build on that and get two steps and three steps. Don't walk into a false paddock and ask them to move for four or five steps because inevitably they're going to get confused and they're not going to understand what it is that you're asking them to do. So keep it simple and know in your mind that you're just teaching them a broad concept. So whilst we teach in a clinic, for example, when we're asking our horse to move to, to a touch, we might move specifically the hind quarter or specifically the fore quarter or specifically sideways or specifically backwards. What I generally would like to, what I generally do in my approach to foals is that I teach the concept first. So I will ask the horse to move from pressure in whichever area presents itself. So if a foal comes up to me and is side on, then I might put my hand on his shoulder or his rib cage and ask him to move away from that. If he's front on with his nose and his chest, I'll go ahead and put my hand on his chest and ask him to back off that. If the hindquarter's there and it presents itself and he's in, a, in the right angle to be able to ask him to do the hindquarter, I'm going to go ahead and ask him to do his hindquarter. So I, I, we need to keep it very simple and we need to take broad brush strokes to start with. So when, when we talk about moving to touch, we're not teaching the nose, teaching the chest, teaching the this, this, this. We're just teaching the concept of move to touch. And that might be for a whole month 
where you know you you'll just start to do it organically the whole mare and foal come up you need to change sides because you want to look at the other side of the mare or maybe you're brushing the mare or something like that and you'll go ahead and you'll just ask that little foal to take one or two steps back and then that's it that's that's enough training for the day keep it simple one thing at a time and reward really 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 tiny pieces of effort and understanding um, and you'll be really amazed by how quickly they can learn stuff I think that we over um, we we try and over train foals so we try and do lots of different things and um, and then just not they're not um, adept to doing lots of different things in one session so keep it simple uh, keep it short so foals have a very short limited attention span because they've got all these needs that are going on all the time so those of you that have had foals before would know that they sleep for such a incredible amount of hours during the day they play if they've got playmates in the paddock for a, you know another incredible amount of hours per day they drink for another incredible amount of hours per day so they're constantly thinking or they're constantly stimulated for the next thing so it doesn't take very long for a foal to sort of go oh I'm I'm thirsty I need to go get a drink and then after they have a drink oh I'm tired I need to go and lay down and then so on and so forth and that rolls through so what we need to do is keep it really short and um, and only get those little tiny you know a couple of steps here a couple of steps there with a foal and I'm talking a newborn foal now I wouldn't be I wouldn't be doing any kind of training longer than five minutes per session um, that's what I have used in the past and I've been very successful in that approach you might do five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the afternoon if they're both coming in for feeding or you know getting moved around or something like that um, you might do two sessions in one day one's fine if you're just going out in the paddock and they're and they're turned out and you're only checking on them once a day um, they'll soon get very used to you coming out and doing that little short session with them and it's going to keep them interested so a short session keeps them on the hook and so then when you discontinue the session or you t you stop training or you you walk away the foal goes oh i was interested in that so next time you come in the paddock they're still interested in you they're not standing there going i'm tired i'm thirsty i want you to leave me alone and they're not disconnected from what's happening so keep it short only a few minutes per session uh, the second last thing that I want to talk about tonight is what we do with our foals when we're handling them and the guidelines that I like to to abide by, I guess you'd say. Um, one of my biggest things is keeping it practical. So I always have in the back of my mind that uh, for both my foals and my adult horses, I always have in the back of my mind, what if I need the vet? what if I need to move them okay so they're my two kind of emergency situation questions what if I need to move my horses as in evacuate from a fire or a flood or something like that or what if the vet comes and needs to you know handle them in some way maybe they've cut their leg maybe the vet needs to inject them something like that so when I think about practical things to be teaching foals what I need to be teaching foals, and this can still be done in your two minutes a day, I need to start building confidence in my foal so he is confident in getting in a trailer and things like that. And you, I do train them to trailer load reasonably quickly. I had a situation once with a uh, three-month-old foal that I had to transport. So, you know, within three months, I and I taught her the way that I teach an adult horse. So we self-load all of our horses and I taught a three-month-old foal how to self-load. So you still do it correctly or the way that you're going to ask your horse to load um you know you don't need to take shortcuts just because it's a foal you know a lot of people tend to manhandle foals onto trailers because they're easy to manhandle because they're so small um so you know keep it practical train them the way that you would train an adult horse but just break it down into those couple of minute sessions um you know and i've got to think about what you know what am i what am i going to be doing with my foal I eventually I'm going to be picking up his feet or early on in the piece I'm going to be picking up his feet so getting him confident with that um, you know worming him I've got to get him confident with you know things being in his mouth 
putting a halter on, not necessarily leading in the really early days, but definitely just being okay with the halter going on and off the head. Obviously, moving to pressure is going to complement the training of the leading and things like that. Uh, and my trailer and handling by the vet so I always think you know oh if there was a terror if there was a situation I need to get the vet out my, my foal's injured is my foal going to be able to cope with you know arms around the body that's typically how a lot of people handle foals if you've got to kind of secure them and, and hold them still because they can be you know pretty jumpy and typically if you wrap your arms around sort of underneath the rump with one arm and then around the chest with the other they can be a little bit easier to sort of handle and um, they can they can stay a little bit calmer if you've taken the time to actually train them to be okay and to relax in, in that cuddle. Um, you know, so I just think about things like that, that that may need to be done with my foal. We had a situation once where um, we had a mare foal down and we weren't 100% confident that the foal had had any colostrum um so we ended up going and getting um milk donated like you know we went and bought milk with colostrum in it for the foal and because it was a newborn foal and because we had to get the colostrum in the foal we really had to manhandle that foal um to get the colostrum into it and of course that is a life or death situation and so you're really going you know what we'll do anything we need to do to get this colostrum into the foal because otherwise there's a chance that they're going to get really sick and all that sort of stuff um that was probably about 10 years ago now and i'm pretty confident that now i would take a different approach um that you know there was a delay in getting the colostrum we had to drive away and get it so there was probably a few hours in which one of us could have stayed with the foal and actually started doing some handling techniques and building confidence and getting the foal uh, quite happy to be caught and coming up to us. Obviously, that would be fast tracking. You're not going to be doing two minutes a day because you're trying to get colostrum into them. But it, we could have made it a little bit easier for her. Whereas as what, what happened, we all went, we got the colostrum and then we came back and then we got the vet and everyone kind of held her down and we, we got the colostrum into her. So again, it was a medical situation, but in hindsight, I would I would have approached it in a different way to hopefully um, build the confidence in that foal because for, you know she was a very, from that day, uh, very skeptical of human beings and quite uh, mistrusting and all that sort of stuff. And that was reflected right through into her being, you know, started under saddle and all that sort of stuff. She was always very, you know, standoffish and didn't trust us. And I'm pretty confident that it came from that handling situation because all of our other foals who didn't need to be handled in that way and, and that were, uh, you know, the confidence was built over time and all the rest of it, and they had positive interactions with humans all the time, then, um, you know, we've never had any kind of trouble with them whatsoever. So, um, you know, keep it practical. Um, keep it positive uh, is another one. Uh, that's a bit of a bonus one. So that's not number five. We're, we're still at number four. This is 4A. Um, keep it positive. Keep your interactions positive. If you can see the foal getting stressed, again, if it's a medical situation or a must-do situation, there's not much you can do about it. If you've got the time, if you can see the foal getting stressed, if you can see that it's a worry or needs to go back to mum or whatever it is, or you can see mum getting distressed, sometimes they'll nick her out and things like that, and you think, oh, you know, the foal's fine. Oh, mum, you're just overreacting. But what mum's doing is telling the foal that what's happening right now isn't positive. So even though you might be thinking, oh, this is going swimmingly and it's fantastic and, you know, the foal's going to be great after this and all the rest of it, mum's over there saying, this isn't good, this isn't good, this isn't good. So that's what's being mapped into that foal. Um, you know, the foal's listening to its mother and thinking, okay, I, this shouldn't be happening or what have you. So need to be keeping it positive and you need to keep all, everyone calm in the situation. Uh, the final thing that I want to talk about tonight is really simple, but it's one of those um, rules. This is a rule that I have um, stuck to through all of our foals, and I find it incredibly powerful tool. Um, and that is that you must terminate the contact with your foal. Do not let your foal get bored or tired or distracted or whatever and terminate the contact with you. So... Um, 
what I mean by that is if you go out in the paddock and you're out there and you're, you know, hanging out with the foal and saying hello and giving him a little scratch or whatever, and then the foal decides, oh, I've had enough of you. I'm going to go over here and look at this stump. What the foal is learning immediately is I can terminate the contact and walk away. I can pick you up and I can be interested in you or pay attention to you when I feel like it, but when I don't feel like it, I'm going to walk away. So something that I feel is really powerful, and again, this is why we have to keep the sessions really short and, um, and positive all the time. One of the things that I do is if I'm, you know, if I walk out into the paddock and I'm sitting there and I'm having a cup of tea or reading a book and I'm just hanging out with the mare in the foal, then obviously the foal may come up and smell you and kind of walk away and, you know, graze near you and, and they're going to come and go. But you're going to sit there, you know, for an hour because you've got a cup of tea or reading a book, right? What I'm talking about is when you're interacting with the foal, so you are you go in the paddock, you catch the foal, whether you're catching it or whether you're just working with it to do, say you're yielding to touch or picking up his feet or something like that, what you don't want to do is sort of ask him to move and then have the foal go, okay, I'm done with that. I'm going to go ahead and leave. What you want to do is do your thing, get your yields, get whatever you're doing, and then you turn your back and you walk away from the foal. So the way that you stop the foal from walking away from you is um, it's a really good opportunity to practice that little cuddle. And you're not trying to hold them strong. You're not trying to make them stay or anything like that. What you want to do is just cuddle them around the body. Wait until they just have that thought about, oh, maybe I don't need to leave right now. And then you take your arms away and then you turn around and walk away. Now, you might stand on the other side of the fence and keep watching your foal. I'm not saying only spend two minutes with your foal and then terminate contact. What I'm saying is when you're in interactive, you need to be the one walking away. If you're just hanging out, then that needs to be very clear that you're just in there hanging out and they're walking, you know, they're coming and going and you're coming and going from them. But if you're doing interactive stuff with that foal, you need to make sure that it's you that walks away um, and terminates the contact and it, and it carries them through. Again, I always think about adulthood for my foal. Um, you know, I don't let my horses, if I'm hanging out with them in the paddock, it's a different story, but I don't like taking my halter off and, and having a horse that turns and bolts away from me they think that they've ter terminated the contact. So when I take my halter off and turn my horse out in the paddock, I make sure that I'm the one immediately moving away from them and they're not moving away from me. So um, that runs through all of our ground training and all of our ridden exercises. It is reflected because it's a mental attitude that's being reflected or developed there, if you like. Uh, like I said, it's, an, it's a mental state of, oh, I get to pay attention when I feel like it and I and I can walk away when I don't feel like it. Well, think about that in your ridden horse. You know, oh, I get to pay attention when I want to, and then when I don't want to, I don't pay attention anymore. That's a really, um, that's a, a really major uh, fault or major. Uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, um, but it, you know, it, for me, that's something that needs to be corrected. Obviously, I want my horse in communication with me the whole time when I'm riding or when I'm leading him or whatever. I don't want him thinking, I can just ignore you whenever I feel like it and look over there. And I know that that's a massive problem that a lot of people have and I see it a lot. Um, so, you know, this is something that if you're aware of it now when you've got a foal, that hopefully it won't be um, a learned behavior. The distraction or walking away from you isn't going to be a learned behavior by the time uh, you're riding them and things like that. So, my five guidelines guidelines for handling foals. Set boundaries early. Keep it simple. Keep it short. Keep it practical. Keep it positive, And you walk away from them. They don't walk away from you. That was the, the keep it positive with the, was the bonus one. So, I hope you enjoyed the uh, Wednesday Night Live tonight. Uh, as you can see, I still haven't got my lighting sorted out. Hopefully, I'll, um, hopefully I'll be able to do that before next week. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. 
I, I can see that there's been comments and things like that made, so I'll go and check them out now. Um, please go ahead and share the replay with anyone who might be interested, who's got follies and everything um, happening this season. Good luck to everyone with their foals this season. Um, I hope you all get what you are wishing for. Thank you again for joining me and I look forward to talking to you or seeing you around. Maybe I'll see you in Bangalore this weekend. We've got a Liberty Clinic uh, and then I'm off to New Zealand, which I'm really looking forward to in the North and South Island. We've got clinics filling up there and then off to the United States. So I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone and I will talk to you all soon. Good night.